It's 1985, and my brother is driving a taxi. He picks up William Sean. He says, aren't you William Sean, the editor of The New Yorker? And Mr. Sean allows us how he is. And then Dee says, my sister works for you, Mary Norris. And Mr. Sean says to Dee, not only does your sister do her job very well, but she's also a good writer. And Dee whoops around and says, well, then why don't you publish her? That was my first literary agent. <laughs> so I am a copy editor. On the copy desk, we change misspellings. We impose New Yorker style on other spellings. We spell theater with an R-E instead of an E-R. We put a hyphen in teenager. And we put a diaresis, those two dots, sometimes taken for an umlaut, over the second O in coordinate and um, pre-existing. Sometimes we tinker with the punctuation, maybe poke in a serial comma, but nothing anyone is going to notice. It's kind of an invisible job. In fact, nobody ever notices you until you make a mistake. But it's a great job, and I'm really lucky to have it. It took me years to claw my way up to the copy desk. <laughs> but what I really want to do is write. I had some success. Mr. Sean bought a few talk stories. I like to think on the merit of the writing and not because he was bullied into it by some cab driver. <laughs> but most of the time, my stories would come back with a pink slip attached that said on it, not right for us. I began to feel as if that would make a good epitaph for me. <laughs> not right for us. I couldn't help but be a little envious of the writers that I copy edited, and I tried to tamp that down. Envy is a great evil, but I couldn't help but notice that for other people at the magazine on the editorial staff, the copy desk was a stepping stone. They went on to become writers or editors or both, and for me, it was this vast plateau it was still a great job. Um, one of the benefits was that there was a night shift, so I had days free, and I could take classes. I studied languages. I took Greek and Italian, and I had time to write. So I embarked on a novel. It was about a woman who worked at a magazine, oddly enough. <laughs> and she had many eccentric co-workers, and she studied languages mostly Greek and Italian, <laughs> and she felt stuck. I had a title. It was called Sophia Rampant. I found an agent, but I did not succeed in publishing it. After many years, I became an okayer. An okayer is a copy editor, a proofreader, a line editor, and a query proofreader all rolled into one. Working on the copy desk is to okaying as the comma is to the semicolon. <laughs> okaying is subtle. A lot depends on it. See? You get to have your own opinions, you get to make suggestions, and your job is to manage the piece through to the printer, making sure no mistakes are introduced during the editorial process. Some of the writers are very appreciative of what we do. Some of the other writers maybe wish we'd lay off a little, but it's okay, you have to know when to stop. So I'm plugging away as an okayer, and I'm trying to revise this novel when something happens that's stranger than anything I could make up. My brother, who you may remember drove a taxi back in the 80s, 
and for the past several years has been working as a church organist, announces that he wants to change gender. Dee has always wanted to be a girl. This came out of nowhere. I, I wasn't ever expecting this. And it happened really fast. Within, it seemed like days, Dee was taking hormones and putting on lipstick and earrings and wearing a tutu. <laughs> she quit the church job and started riding around the village on a gigantic tricycle <laughs> with a concert harp attached to the back, <laughs> playing the accordion and singing Shirley Temple songs. <laughs> Some of you may have seen her. You may remember her. She was a legend in the village, the fabulous Baby D. But I'm sorry now that I didn't understand better what Dee was going through at that time. I could have written about it. But <laughs> I, was, I was just too angry. See, I'd always been the only girl in the family. <laughs> and I was always jealous of Dee for being a boy. Clearly, they got a better deal. And I was instantly sure that Dee was going to be better at being a girl than I was. She was certainly trying harder. So, after a while, Dee went to Europe, and that was kind of a relief because we were estranged. But while she was in Amsterdam, she had a kind of spiritual awakening or something and decided to go back to Cleveland, our hometown, and take care of our parents in their old age. So how could I not appreciate that? I started to accept D, and I began to see that that person I loved was still in there. And once I was no longer angry, I decided now I can write about this, and I embarked on a memoir. It was about our shared childhood, Dee's transformation, and my reaction. Now, I was sure this was going to be my big break. I had a lot invested in it. Several agents looked at it, and they all passed on it for one reason or another. You know, not right for us. So, so I was beginning to get discouraged. I'd never lost the desire to write. But I had been a copy editor now for about 30 years. So um, it looked like maybe that was it. Maybe I was just going to be a copy editor. My, it made me think of my father. My father was a fireman in Cleveland. And I had this insight about that when I was in college, that when dad was growing up, he hadn't had any burning desire to become a fireman. He had a family to support, he took a job, it was a good job, he stuck with it, and 20, 25 years later, that was it, he was a fireman. Maybe being a copy editor was like being a fireman. So that's where I was in the spring of 2012, when two young women from the magazine's website came to the door of my office it's a nice office with a window looking out on the Empire State Building. And they tell me, some guy has written a piece for the New York Times that makes fun of New Yorker commas. Would I write something about commas? <laughs> so I thought, commas? You want me to write about commas? Then I remembered, oh yeah, I've been a copy editor for 30 years and I pretty... <laughs> I should probably know something about commas. <laughs> so I have on my desk this artifact from a legendary New Yorker proofreader. It's a canister with a lid that has perforations in it. And it, wrapped around it is brown paper with commas drawn on it in pencil and the words comma shaker. <laughs> this was her comment on New Yorker style that we sprinkled in the commas. <laughs> but of course, there's a reason for every one of those commas, and I suddenly saw how I could do it. And the piece ran on the New Yorker's website. It was called In Defense of Nutty Commas, and it went viral. 
I had been writing a blog on alternate side parking for the last couple of years. <laughs> and I had a devoted audience that numbered in the tens. <laughs> and that comma piece was read by thousands of people. Somebody wrote on Twitter, the New Yorker is blogging about commas. It's like Christmas morning. So, <laughs> so, so I realized I, I had broken a taboo. The New Yorker has always been famously guarded and snobbish about its editorial practices. But once I had opened that door, all these questions came gushing in, you, you know. Um, so what is it with the diaresis? Why do you put two L's in traveled and put an extra S in focused? Why do you write out numbers that are not large and round like 433,226? The short answer to that is we like words better than we like numbers. So suddenly I had a column and I wrote about profanity in the magazine, I wrote about semicolons, I wrote about a character in the old English alphabet called the thorn. And it was um, going pretty well and I, I was kind of, oh I also wrote about pencils. I still use pencil on paper and I'm a terrible snob about pencils. I like a nice soft lead. And <laughs> It turned out, who knew? There is a huge online community of pencil fanciers. So, so all this was very encouraging, and I got back in touch with the last agent to have passed on my memoir and asked him if he thought there would be any interest in a book on pencils and punctuation. He was very enthusiastic. And he helped me put together a proposal, and he sent it out in August of 2012. And within weeks, I had a very heady series of meetings with editors and publishers in their offices, and it went to auction. I felt like a prize heifer. <laughs> and I got a book contract. Finally! Right. Finally, I was recognized as a writer. So the, one of the people who was so happy for me about this was my sister, Dee. She started sending me links to silly cars that I could squander my advance on. So I ended up buying a 2005 Mini Cooper convertible, and I call it the car that commas bought. Uh, Dee was also very good at exhorting me to keep my eye on the prize and that this was all, the great thing was that at the end of this, there was going to be this book. So I wrote about commas and semicolons and who and whom and the subjective and the objective case and dictionaries and dangling participles and the grammatical meaning of the word gender. D, by the way, is now married and living in the Netherlands and has a book, uh, an album coming out in the spring, so she'll be touring, touring Europe at the same time as I'm on the book tour here. So something else amazing happened as a kind of side effect of all this. I'm not envious anymore. Except of people in the new offices who have an office with a window. So. <laughs>